Oh, gracious and holy God, we give you thanks that you have brought us to this place on this very day to hear your words of hope, to once again prepare our hearts to make room for your Son, Jesus the Christ. As we enter this Advent season, Almighty God, we ask that your presence be powerful in our lives. We ask that you allow us to be calm and still over the next days and weeks so that we might not miss your voice to us. We ask that we will have our hearts and our minds and our ears and our eyes open for opportunities that we may serve you, that we might bump up against you. We thank you for all that you have given us and the many blessings. And we pray, Lord, that during this season we are mindful mindful of your goodness and your bounty, but that we are also good stewards, that we are gracious, for we do have an abundance. We lift up those this day, almighty God, who continue to have to deal with atrocities that, that just are, for us, not understandable. We lift up those in Paris and Brussels. We lift up those in Colorado and Chicago. We lift up those that have been affected by the winter weather. We lift up those who this day find news that they don't want to hear. And we lift up those who rejoice at news that they will hear. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are shut in. We pray for those who do not find hope this day. May you surround them with your presence and your peace and your grace. We pray for those who protect us locally and nationally and globally. We pray for wisdom and guidance. We pray that all folks might have food to eat this day. And we pray, Almighty God, that all folks will be sheltered from the elements of nature. We pray for those who are incarcerated we pray for those seeking justice and mercy. We pray for those who ask for forgiveness. We pray for those who give forgiveness. We lift ourselves to you, almighty God. Help us to be instruments of peace and justice, of mercy and grace, of love and hope abiding. We lift our prayers to you. And together we lift the prayer which you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our New Testament lesson comes this morning from the Gospel according to Luke. I'm reading from the 21st chapter, verses 25 through 36, and if you would like to follow along, you can find it in the New Testament in your pew Bible. I think it's on page 80. Listen now for God's powerful and life-giving word to you. There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dispensation of drunkenness and the worries of this life that the day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Got a good Charlie Brown little strip for you. Charlie Brown says, Lucy, do you think the world will come to an end in our time? Lucy replies, I try not to think about such things, Charlie Brown. Well, says Charlie Brown, now that I've brought it to your attention, what do you think? Well, Charlie Brown, when things that I try not to think about are brought to my attention, I try not to think about them. My guess is that we are kind of like Lucy and not Charlie Brown when it comes to this passage. As we begin to think about preparing for Christmas, about making lists and putting up lights and decorations and getting our packages sent, our baking done, contemplating the end of time is probably not one of the things that you thought about this past weekend. At least I know I didn't, other than because of the scripture. You see, I don't think the scripture reason fits our definition of what a joy-filled season looks like. The setting of this reading is not on city streets and busy sidewalks dressed in holiday cheer. This reading is loaded with intense apocalyptic drama and eschatological imagery sounding more like the prophets that we will read Isaiah and Ezekiel and Joy Joel, who pictures the arrival of God with distressing language and frightening imagery rather than a writer of good news to which we are accustomed. Distress among the nations, confusion by the roaring of the sea and the waves. Even the powers of heavens are shaken and people will faint from fear and apprehension. You have to admit that this is a very interesting passage for the first Sunday of Advent, as we celebrate the candle of hope. We hear Jesus speaking a nod about his first coming as a sweet baby boy born in a manger in Bethlehem, but rather the anticipation of his second coming. On first glance, this probably doesn't sound like good news for us to hear, but it is. You see, Luke is really not trying to scare us or frighten us. Luke is not Scrooge or the Grinch. 
Luke is actually espousing words of comfort and hope, reminding us, the children of God, that we are to live in hope regardless as things might seem or appear. We are not to live cynically or irresponsibly as those who do not know who, who not, and who have not seen, but rather we are reminded to look beyond the chaos and violence that this fills our world and live in confidence of God's victory. You see, this passage reminds us that no matter what happens, God's victory is sure. It was from the very beginning. It is now, and it will always be. Jesus the Christ came in to usher in the kingdom of God. He came in to show us what the kingdom looks like and what it will entail. This scripture reminds us that we are to live a life filled with the expectation and anticipation, not just of a sweet baby boy born in Bethlehem, but also the fact that Christ is present each and every day when we live Christ-like lives. The Christmas season celebrates the fact that Christ has already entered our world and continues to enter our world new each day. This holy season of Advent reminds us God abiding and loving daily presence in our lives. It reminds us that forgiveness and restoration and redemption are made possible because of God's unconditional and eternal love for us as seen through this baby boy who grows into a man and travels to the cross. The scripture, what it says to me, is that every time we make the choice to live in Christ, Christ appears. There is a new beginning every time we express our relationship with the one who abides in us. Christ is present every time we articulate an incarnational love for strangers and for foes, as well as loved ones. Every time we connect with someone and invite them to form a meaningful relationship, Christ emerges. Every time we clothe ourselves in Christ-like values, like authenticity and inclusiveness, like generosity and compassion, like hospitality and grace, Christ's presence is evident. Every time we choose the more excellent way, Christ appears in a real, visible, and transforming way to offer us a new beginning. Eugene Patterson, and he's the one, if you know, he wrote The Message. He writes this in his book, The Living Message, Daily Help for Living a God-Centered Life. He points out that what a lot of people call hope in reality is something different. It's wishing, not hoping. Wishing and hoping are not the same thing, says Patterson. Wishing is something we all, is something all of us do. It projects what we want or think we need in the future. I wish for this to happen. I wish I had this. Just because we wish for something good or holy, we think it qualifies as hope, but it doesn't. Wishing extends our egos into the future, Hope grows out of our faith. Hope grows out of our faith. Hope is oriented towards what God is doing. Wishing is oriented towards what we are doing. Peterson goes on to say that we can picture wishing as though it were a line coming out from us with an arrow on the end, pointing into the future, pointing towards that thing we most want to possess. Hope is just the opposite. It's a line that comes from God out of the future with its arrow pointing towards us. Hope grows out of our faith. Hope is orientated towards what God is doing, wishing 
is oriented towards what we are doing. I came across a story about a young man who wanted to change his life. So he went to church and he sat down in the sanctuary for a while all by himself. He took out a piece of paper and a pencil and he began to write down a long list of things he promised that he would do to change his life. He had a whole page of things. And then at the very bottom, he signed his name. And he took it up and he placed it on the communion table. And he sat down back in his seat in the sanctuary. And as he was sitting there, he began to sense the voice of God speaking softly in his own soul. And the more he listened, the more he heard God saying to him, you've done it all wrong. I want you to get back up there and get that piece of paper and tear it up. And then I will give you another instruction. So the young man did as he heard. He got up out of his pew and he walked up to the communion table and he took that piece of paper and he tore it up. And then he went and he sat down and he waited for the Lord to instruct him. And he waited, for it did not happen immediately. But finally he sensed the Lord speaking to him. And very gently, this is what the Lord said to him. Now take out a piece of paper and sign your name at the bottom. And let me fill in the rest. Hope grows out of our faith. Hope is oriented towards what God is doing in our lives, in the life of this church, in our community, and in the world. We come into this Advent season being challenged to gaze not into the sky, not longing for days that will come, but rather we come this day to gaze into our heart in the heart of each other. For Advent reminds us that every time we love one another as Christ loves us, Jesus appears in a real, intangible way. Our candle of hope reminds us that the one born in a manger in Bethlehem came into the world to bring God's light, God's peace, God's joy and to answer our hope. Let us pray. Oh God, as we enter the season of Advent, we pray that our hearts and our minds and our souls be awakened to your presence in our lives. May your spirit of hope and truth and love Guide us this day and always. Amen.